to the brand new webinar series from Community Finance Ireland, supporting GA clubs on and off the pitch. Just to let everybody know that this event is being recorded. And if people are tuning in and you're wondering what this is all about, it's a series of virtual conversations with some of the most passionate GA clubs across Ireland. And over the next few weeks, we'll be hearing from clubs and local heroes about the challenges they are facing, how they're investing in their future through social finance and about passing the baton on to the next generation of change makers in their communities. So really exciting and informative series ahead. And just to introduce myself then, my name is Ashton O'Reilly. I'm delighted to be hosting the webinar series. I'm a full-time sports reporter with Off The Ball, which involves a mix of presenting live from studio in Dublin and then going out broadcasting live from games and interviewing players and managers in all sports really, but mainly GA, rugby and football. And then personally then, I would be passionate about sport, both as a fan and as a player. I play for a Rato GA club in County Meath. I've been involved in my club for over 20 years now. It's a massive part of my life. And I've seen the growth in my club, I suppose, when I started to now and how the improvement in facilities has had a knock-on effect to the success, I suppose, within my club. When I started, there wouldn't have been any ladies team for camogie or football. We would have played with the lads up until the age of 14. And then eventually we got both football and camogie into our club. And I do think because of the facilities we have within our club now, we really see that we're getting the success on the pitch. But I currently, I do live up north in County Down, uh, not too far from the Kulku, the All-Ireland Champions. A lot of people know them. Um, and I do actually train up there two, three times a week. Uh, two clubs up there, Mayo Bridge and Drumgat GA, were lovely that they actually let me come and join the clubs and they let me train there so I don't have to be up and down the road all the time. So I think all of us know that that's a really important aspect of the GA. You know, they once you move to a new place you know you can get involved and you can have that community feel to it so uh, yeah that was really important and it's massive to me now as I'm living up north so that's enough about me let me introduce to you the the three panelists for tonight uh, Jim Riley Mullahore and GFC and Cabin Jim is a team mentor and technical fundraising sport how are you Jim very good thank you Ashley good Jim Connor Woods head of finance of the development committee from Karen Ross GFC from County Mead, and of course, it is your birthday as well. Happy birthday, Connor! Thanks, Ashley. Yeah. <laughs> Good to have you, and of course, then Donal Trainer, Group CEO of Community Finance Ireland. How are you, Donal? I'm good. Thanks a million, Ashley. Good, and thank you as well to our audience for joining. We'd like to get as much audience participation as possible, so please don't be shy and do get involved. You can actually post comments and questions for the panel through the Q&A function here um, on Zoom or on Twitter using the hashtag supporting GA. And I'm gonna to get to those questions as the session progresses. So I'll just start by coming to each of you just to tell me a little bit about your role within your club and a little bit about your club as well. Jim, do you wanna kick us off? Sure. Um, so with Mullahorn, I've been on the executive for the past 10 years or so. I've actually stepped away a little bit this year. Um, so my main roles at the moment are working on the fundraising side of things on the weekly lotto draw as well as uh, being a general technical uh, resource for the club which pretty much means anything anytime anybody's got a question about something electronic it ends up with me and um, also uh, mentoring two of our club's teams on both the men's and the ladies side so the under nine boys and the under 14 girls well where do you get the time for all of that <laughs> I, I, i'm struggling to understand myself <laughs> brilliant and connor do you want to give us a, a little brief update as well Hi, Ashley. Um, Connor Woods. I'm um, involved in Connor Ross GSC, which is just um, a club in North County Mead. Um, I'm on the executive for a number of years, and uh, I uh, we put together a development committee about six years ago to look at our facilities. And um, we have um, done a lot of work in the last um, four to five years in that area, and we still have more work to do. It's, it's a work in progress. Um, so re really enjoy that. Um, I played football on my life at Connor Ross, um, born and bred here, and uh, my kids now play with the club. Uh, I coached the under nine boys and the under 11 girls. And um, up until about four years ago, I I, uh, I played played the la our, our last uh, bit of football. I, I, we won a junior D championship in Meaden 2018. So um, I, I escaped without getting any injuries. Uh, so now I just I coach and I, I, I work on the development committee. Um, uh, my wife's also a coach in the club, so um, uh, it's, a, it's a huge part of our community and our lives. That's great, and we'll definitely get into that chat just about the transition, I suppose, from the pitch to then going and being so involved as a volunteer as well. 
that's a, a massive part of any club. So we'll definitely get into all of that. And Donald, do you want to give us a, a bit of an update of your role? Update is right. Uh, my, my life with the GA would have started back in, in Killing Care in County Cavan. Um, and it was probably only about uh, I'd say eight or nine years that I transferred to a, a club in Mead, which, which to be honest, you talk to the person Cavan. It's an awful thing to do. Anyway, um, it, it has worked out fairly well. I, uh, I would have been involved in the executive in Cavan. I would have been involved in the executive in, in Waterstown and Mead for, for a short while as well. I've done a bit of coaching under 15 girls last year uh doing a little bit of helping with under 11 boys this year as well um but most of the time my uh my my uh activity is 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 helping and supporting the likes of the guys in Carner Ross and Mullahorn and other clubs around the around the island north and south and um, so that's what takes up most of my time these days unfortunately and so you're a meat man now then <laughs> never no <laughs> oh he is he is <laughs> 20 years, Donald, you have to be. <laughs> but the transfer through anyway, and there was no objections at Ulster Council, so it was great. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, it is great to hear as well that uh, you came from different clubs, so we'll hear that side of things as well. I think that's nice for people to also hear. And then you've worked with the clubs here, with, with Jim's Club and Connor's Club, so we'll hear all about that. So, Jim, do you want to tell me a little bit about maybe some of the, the challenges that Mullahore and Club would have faced? Oh, well, look, at as a club, we've been developing our resources for the past, I don't know, 20 years or more. I suppose the, the, the pitch itself is about 40 years old at this stage, and it's, it's had a couple of good long looks at it, uh, just in terms of its quality. And I know one of the things that we've done over the more recent years has been a little bit of work on drainage on and try to improve the, the playing surface. And I can't remember if community finance were involved in that, but certainly, um, you know, part of the, the fundraising and, and the bridging and all of that would, would have involved community finance for a lot of our projects. Uh, but, you know, we've had some long term, I guess, debt, which we've been working through for the past uh, several years. Um, you know, it's been a really uh, big challenge for the success of executives who've come into the club. And we've had a few different uh, chairmen over the past several years who've really kind of stepped up and took on trying to uh, manage that overall debt. But at the same time, progressing the club and developing more as we've gone along. So we've, you know, set up some really successful fundraisers from car draws to holiday draws. And uh, we've recently set up for, for the last few years, okay, COVID got in the way a little bit, but a really successful country music uh, festival every year, uh, which has been really successful in terms of bringing funds into the club and just sort of taking down that overall debt, but as well as that, making sure that we've got the room to go and sort of look at our most recent development, which was purchasing some land adjacent to our fields so we can develop that. And, you know, we're right in the process of that at the moment where we're getting the playing surface in order and trying to get floodlights set up and ball nets and you know the 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 challenges never stop you know the, the the wheels keep on turning you need to keep on developing and and making sure your resources are up to speed for you know the challenges as that we face just in terms of um the amount of the sheer amount of actual players that are coming through the place so you know we're really blessed at the moment from an underage perspective we've got a, a lot of uh, age grades where we've got two teams out to represent us but that in itself brings challenges in terms of one one playable field and trying to get all of those matches played and trying to get the uh, the training sessions in place and giving everybody the amount of time they need or 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 want on the field. So look at lots going on in terms of development, lots of challenges into the future. And you know I think the, the key thing for us is to keep developing, keep fundraising, and keep partnering with organisations such as Community Finance to make sure that we're able to do that. That's brilliant. And just the fundraising you're speaking about as well, that's so creative to come up with those different ideas. The concert you were talking about at the festival, it's so different, but I suppose you have to be constantly thinking of, of different ways and what hasn't been done. So, so that's brilliant to hear. And Connor, for you and your club in Karna Ross, what are some of the challenges you would have faced? Um, well, actually, in 1987, we were our, our official GA pitch was the back of the, the parochial house in Canner Ross um, in a field owned by a farmer and you'd be sorting up the field I remember as a kid and you'd be dodging cow poos um, so that was our origins um, and in 87 we um, my father would have been the president of the club our, ch our chairman and president now but um, we we borrowed money from um the bank at the time um and we built um we, we bought land um in, in, on the Kells Road at the village and we developed our pitch and it was opened in 87 uh it was a, it was a I think it was Mead and Cavan actually was a was the was the we had just won 
um, one of the All Ireland. So there was great buzz around the Mead team at that time. So um, so we that was our springboard. Uh, we built um, a clubhouse and, and a single pitch, and um, we from then on really we we've just I suppose. We had a very good um in, in, in the 90s we won an intermediate championship but we won um a couple of league titles and we're a senior and then we we kicked on then in, in the 2000s and we we really developed our underage infrastructure and um we um we felt then in uh we put together a development committee there in in 2014 15 16 and we we felt that the facilities weren't fit fit for purpose for the future and we um we met uh, with with Donal and Community Finance in 20, 2018 and uh, we we sought a facility to build a um, four and a half thousand square foot facility, which is uh, indoor training, um, dressing rooms, uh, meeting rooms, fabulous clubhouse. And um, unfortunately, it opened or finished in the middle of COVID, and we couldn't really enjoy it or use it. But um, uh, we eventually got there anyway, and um, it's transformed the club because it has given us the facilities to uh, to, to basically um, open a G- an LGFA club. And uh, we 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 um, for the first time we were able to actually have proper facilities for men and women, which is, has been transformational for the club. Um, not to dwell on that, but we, we, we kicked on then last year and we got another grant and we're building our second pitch now. Um, and we, we did a, a walkathon um, in 2021 and we raised over 75,000, um, which is a 24 hour walkathon around the pitch, um, which is brilliant. And so um, we, we've two, we're going to one of two walking tracks and two full size pitches and really good training, training rooms and facilities. So Similar to, to Jim there in Mullahorn, it's a it's a continuous work in progress. You know, you, you're always, you know, this will be this will do us for a period of time, and then the next generation come up, and then we'll, you know, they'll look at what we have done. Um, it's a generational. Um, they look back at what their forefathers, foremothers did, and they'll probably kick it on in the next generation. You know, so um, it's a continuous development and a continuous work in progress um, for the community. Oh, that's amazing. And just as you're mentioning that the LGFA side of things has kicked off as well. So you do need those training facilities, that extra pitch, you know, all of those things. So that's brilliant to hear. And Donald, you've obviously been out with these clubs. You're out on the field yourself. So you can see the benefits that obviously the, these clubs are reaping now. Yeah, I mean, look, I spent many years playing and going to very intimidating looking clubs. So my aspirations here is to make them all look very welcoming to the opposition and, and you know, aesthetically pleasing. Um, but and, and, and Mullahorn would be a case in point there. Um, you know, it's it's great to be able to 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 to, to facilitate these clubs who are full of change makers and full of full of guys with great ambition, guys and girls with great ambition, you know, embracing uh embracing the community at large rather than just the lads that can play a bit of ball, you know, they're 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 looking at and bringing in new members of the community that might never have kicked a ball before. You have the dads and lads and the mothers and others now as well. You know, you have a lot of groups developing walkways around pitches that you know double up as as running tracks for training in in, in bad weather and stuff like that. So it's it's great. It's really really great to say you know the, you know the, the phrase now G A is where we all belong, but it really is very welcoming for any member of the community to get involved and become a local member of the GA club, regardless of whether they ever have any ambition to kick a ball at all. It's, 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 it's just a big family. And uh, for, for our, for our, from where, where we are, we just want to be able to facilitate and develop the best infrastructure that, that club deserves and that community deserves. Yeah, that's something that came up quite a bit on our, our first webinar um, in the North of Ireland was that community hope that it, it, as you said, Donald, it doesn't matter if you've never played before. Um, one of the, guys were saying just about the you know there's bingo on on Sundays and that brings out a lot of people there's a walking track there's a play park there's all of these things that is within a GA club now that it doesn't matter if you're if you're not involved with the teams as such you know there there is a a place for everyone and something that I did wonder is about emigration and then you're competing with clubs in, in larger towns and cities and that can make it difficult I suppose for clubs in rural areas to survive so Jim for you in Mullahorn how has your club overcome that? Um, well, look, we, we've got challenges. I mean, they, our senior clubs are not exactly at their highest performance levels at the moment. And a lot of that, I, I suppose, can be put down to player availability, whether it's through emigration or, or th- even through work. So, for example, you see a lot of uh, challenges within 
some of the teams where you know you got trainings on maybe on a Saturday, Sunday morning and maybe some of the girls are doing uh, working somewhere where they just can't make it to it and so those are challenges that we need to work with in terms of the employers that are around and, and even the t- players themselves to try to uh, get them involved and keep them involved because long term there's a benefit for them and they just need to we just need to make sure that they can see what I guess what we're bringing to the table for them and just in terms of that involvement that team spirit uh, the friendships that they're developing I mean the you know, a lifetime of connections that have that's available through the GA and the LGFA, and just to make sure that they can see that they're not maybe missing it through the tunnel vision is something that's maybe uh, a short-term objective for them. Um, we look at some of the some of the players leaving. Yeah, absolutely. But there's a panel of of young people coming through. There's a new generation, and and so that's one of the things that we've been looking at primarily is is just the amount, sheer amount of youth that are playing at the moment, and you know that obviously makes you uh, very um, well, optimistic for the future, but it still remains a kind of a challenge to keep them playing. So you, you know, you've got two teams. How do you keep everybody happy? How do you make sure that they they're all getting game time? And all of it is to keep them involved in the sport, so that you know, ultimately, they reap the benefits. We reap the benefits as a community. And you know, you've got that whole social element that you pointed out a little bit earlier that they're able to really see all of the uh, all of the community taking part in that. Yeah, it's a massive challenge, I suppose, to keep everyone involved and keep them interested, you know, in playing and to continue playing. Uh, but that's great to hear you haven't really had any trouble in fielding teams. Connor, would you have had trouble, I suppose, in in having numbers and fielding teams over the years? Yeah, similar to Jim there. I mean, like we're, we're a small parish, um, a small community. I think the population of Connor is only about 11 or 1200, um, probably becomes about 1400 weekends, you know. Uh, but I suppose... Um, immigration and uh, work, um, I suppose work like guys traveling or girls traveling to Dublin and that living living and working in Dublin and trying to get down for training during the during the week has been has been uh, tough sometimes because um, you know they might get out of work till about half six seven and then you're hitting traffic and all that. Um, <clears throat> to, I'd say um, immigration as well has been a big factor over the last few years, particularly with young people going to places like Australia and that. But um, remarkably, I think COVID has been transformational in many ways as well, because um, through COVID, one of the positive outcomes of COVID has been the remote working uh, for a lot of companies now. So um, we would have instances now where a lot of young people um, and middle-aged people who would be still playing involved in the club, they're no longer, you know, commuting as much to Dublin, uh, still doing a bit of it, but not as much. And remote working has enabled them to be um, more restful and to be able to base themselves at home a bit more and it's it's more conducive to um to, to being able to get into the pitch in a much better uh, state of mind physically and mentally at 7 30 for training so um so that was one of the positives out of covid um in the sense that people are, are, are doing a bit more remote work and i think it has, it has brought more life to rural ireland um because um it has, it has, you know, it has opened up the way we work and the way we live. And as I think a lot of people got um, uh, that kind of um, um, very refreshing um, uh, positive outcomes out of, out of a bad thing, which was COVID. Um, but, um, you know, as I said, we are a small parish and a small club. Um, so we've really focused an awful lot on community. And if you go down there to the pitch tonight, um, we have a nursery um, that starts off four and a half. And that then we've got under sevens we've got which is which is mixed and then we've under nine boys under nine girls under 11 boys under 11 girls and there'll be 150 100, 140 kids there tonight uh last night there would have been uh, under 13s boys and girls and under 15s so that's the that's the future of the club you know the friendships they make um i remember the guys i played football with uh they're now coaching the teams with me and our and our kids are playing football together like that's magic you know it's not it's not it's not happens in every situation but when it does happen it is fabulous and um it's something that um helps bring that generational aspect to the to the GA um and as, as Donald said it's it's where we all belong really because the the emergence of LGFA particularly in our club we, we doubled our membership in the space of three years um and now the the ladies and the girls we have got um, seven ladies teams uh, between not nine up to a- adult, and that's fabulous. And um, um, there is welcome. Uh, there's no friction between men, female in the club. They get on really well. 
everyone gets on well together. It's everyone's club. There's no kind of like superiority or there's no kind of like hierarchical authority. It's it's all equal representation and which is really positive and everyone just feels welcome. And I think that's that's um that that's that's help, you know, help brings all that community spirit together because when you kick on the next generation, it's not just now the boys who who have fond memories of playing local football, it's the boys and the girls. Um, now, I know some clubs have had LGFA clubs um, going back a number of years, as Jim has said there in Mullahorn, but it's our first taste of it. Um, our LGFA club is only three years old and the, the positive impact it's had in our community has been amazing. Yeah, and just before we came on, I, I was just telling you as well, I'm involved in a club up north from Gath and they just started a ladies team this year. And the impact that is made, even on the lads team, is incredible, even in terms of fundraising and social <clears> events and just the support from one another. Like you actually see all of them come out and support the girls teams. They go to all of the games, which I was a little bit shocked by. You know, it did take me back a bit. I was like, wow, the whole team like nearly come out. It's nearly, a, you know, on Saturdays, a thing to do. They come to the games and everyone goes out after and it's vice versa. The girls will go to their games. And I think it's something that they really missed within their club. You hear a lot of the the older generation within the club saying, you know, I wish we did this earlier. So that that's brilliant to hear that, Connor. And don't I suppose when you're out meeting these clubs and you're involved at Walter Standing came to me, do you see the benefit, I suppose, of, of LGA, LGFA within the clubs? Oh, oh, without a doubt. Yeah, they just bring so much colour and creativity and, and, and initiative to, to the game. I mean, I, I've always said, I mean, a simple thing like the way they, they, they do the clock, in the LGFA yeah. <laughs> countdown. I mean, the amount of controversy that have, would have ended if it hadn't been brought into the male game would be unbelievable. You know, it just like about, about, about referees adding you know, on time looking for draws and things like that. I mean, that's just, I mean, no, the initiative and the creativity that, that's there and the colour that they bring, you know, and, and, and you know, they're not behind the coming forward to uh, even even at a, a kind of fundraising level, they, they'll put themselves out there and they'll put the shoulder to the wheel and, and, and make a big difference in terms of contributing and, and getting and getting people involved in, in, uh, in fundraising. So that's it's brilliant. No, it's really, really good. Yeah, it's so great to see. And it's brilliant to hear all of the clubs have now got LGFA teams. I think majority of clubs across Ireland do, which is unbelievable to see. And one in eight people in Ireland, um, they're now from a migrant background. So I think this is important to mention too. You know, how do you foster that diversity in a club, Jim? Um, and how important do you see that being to the future of the club? Well, I suppose um, Mullerhorn is probably a, a little bit more rural than most of it. We probably don't have that level of diversity in the locality. I was just having a quick look at the 2016 census uh, figures a little bit earlier today. And, you know, it, there were very low numbers uh, from say outside who weren't born in Ireland or, um, or I said there was a few EU nationals there. But at the same time, uh, we do have a few uh, young people playing with us. And I think the key thing is not to put up barriers. Um, you know, we're, we're very much involved with the, the school. Um, you know, we, we try to make sure that all of our trainings, et cetera, are pushed out through the schools, that they're, everyone's aware of it. Um, and to make sure that we're, we have an open door policy, right? So, you know, where somebody hasn't necessarily ever played it before. And so there's some great examples of kids who come along and, and they're brilliant. They're absolutely brilliant. They've never even seen, maybe even seen a Gaelic football before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, by the end of the session, they're, they're up and down the place. But at the same time, it's just a matter of, of making sure that we're there to support them, that we kind of understand maybe where they're coming from a background perspective and, and just try to nurture them the same way as we would any other kid who walks in the door. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's interesting, Nashleen, in terms of, uh, I know, your definition of a migrant, because uh, in Cavan, if we have people from Wexford or Limerick or Tipperary coming in, they're actually viewed as migrants. And the, the truth be told, they're, they're fantastic. They're fantastic to, to come into a club. And I, I, I've actually real life experience of a club's fortunes being changed completely when a chairman and a treasurer from outside the county uh, came into the community and took over the reins. And it was just, it just brings a new lease of life, a life, a new lease of energy. Um, they don't have the political baggage of the historical falling outs 20 and 30 years ago and the factions. They just have, have this way of gelling the community. And, and in Walterstown and Mead, I mean, if, if you took the dubs out of it now, it'd be a lonely enough spot. So uh, fair play, you know, that's what I say. Well, I'm from Retoton County Mead, so I think you all know there's a lot of dubs around here. I'm not one, though. <laughs> I'm a true royal, <laughs> I swear. And Connor, would yeah. you see this, I suppose, in, in Karen Ross then as well? And... Um, 
other people from outside coming in and getting involved in the club that are, I suppose, not from there originally? Oh, absolutely. I mean, our, our senior club chairman at the moment is, is from Ballancall in Cork and our, our juvenile chairman uh, is from Portumna. And uh, our our um, our lady our lady's chair is from Tyrone. I, I'm the vice chair, but yeah, it's it's the one that says it's it's fabulous. I mean, like it's it doesn't. And we we I said this before at the AGM in our club. It doesn't matter what colour your skin, what what parts of the world you come from, uh, or, or 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 the sexual orientation you have. If you if you can kick football and or if you don't even want to kick football, if you want to just come out come down and be part of it, you're welcome. I mean, like. If you start putting barriers up, you're 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 just living in the Stone Age. Um, it makes the diversity. Um, it brings all the the energy to it. You know, um, we would have a small community in Canaros. We wouldn't have too many um, um migrants from outside of Ireland. We would have a few actually, small number now. You know, uh, and 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 though and, and they've been school, the national school, and they would play football and they're they've they're, they've made fabulous contributions to the, to the teams over the years. Um, so, um, but without a shadow of a doubt, the, the bringing in fresh blood from outside the county and the club uh, breaks down the barrier, as Donald said, for the old factions, because um, it does certainly bring a freshness to it. Um, and, uh, you know, it, 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 they bring new ideas, actually. Um, our club chair actually would have played a lot of rugby, as he, uh, uh, you know, when he was younger. Um, and uh, he, you know, he, and, and GA, but, you know, even from having played different sports brings a different energy to it. And also, I think as well, the other thing we see nowadays is that um, a lot of our kids are actually playing a lot more sports than what I played. Like when I was a kid, I played Gaelic and that was it. Um, but now the kids are playing soccer, rugby, um, swimming, tennis, whatever, you know. And I think that they're coaching under different coaches from different codes and different sports and, and different backgrounds. And I think that all kind of presents different um, uh, in, interesting dynamics to the, to the mixes. And, you know, the approach to coaching with young people uh, is, has, you know, is, is, has moved on from what it once was. And, you know the whole approach to, to 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 mentoring and 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 coaching a young team. Um, I, I did the safeguarding course there a couple of weeks ago, and um, you know it's 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 a continuous evolving kind of education path we're on. You know, um, and I think the key message is that what we did say a couple of years ago is not going to work anymore. Um, I read a book there recently. Um. Uh, and it was all about change and transformation. And it says literally that any any company, business, sporting organization or individual who continues to do what they did uh, into the future without changing and evolving uh, will be won't survive. So no different to a sports club, coaching techniques and um, openness. You have to be, be open to change and you have to move with 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 keep keep progressive and and that's what makes you um that's what helps makes the, the will help make the club survive and grow uh, into the future if it doesn't change it'll just it'll it'll fade that's so important i think we're all learning and developing and it's important we learn from each other and that was something i was going to bring up next just about having young people involved within the club in terms of the the committees you know for jim you and mullahorn is there any maybe young club members that are involved in the committee end of things? I suppose there's a real mix. Um, so, for example, you know, you got, uh, you know, going back to the previous one, you got new people coming into the club, and it's a great way to integrate somebody. Um, I'm just thinking to our physio, for example, who joined the executive last year, really an active member of the executive, and has really been helpful in in helping out with the physio work on the, on the senior team. Uh, but also just getting uh, some of the younger player representatives into the the various different executive panels. Uh, but you know, one of our our bigger things at the moment, uh, and I may have mentioned it earlier, is all of the fundraising efforts. So you know, we're trying to drive a lot of um, smaller fundraising efforts this year, like maybe a, a golf classic here, a tractor or truck run there, uh, some draws, and you're you're drawing on your player panel um, a lot to support you for those efforts. And you know, as they get involved, obviously they've got a voice, and you know everybody is encouraged where they've got a voice and they've got an opinion you know don't don't sit on the bar stool and voice it get involved with the administration you know try and make your 
whatever way you see of doing things has been the right way of doing it. If you can get people to agree with you, the only place you're going to do that is within the club structures. And hopefully, uh, you know, we haven't been blocking anybody out from coming to that. And, you know, one of the other things that really is looking at the progression of officers within a club, I, I think you'll go stale. Uh, with somebody in the same position for 10, 20 years. I, I think you need to have some turnover there, but it needs to be kind of on a stage basis. You can't just shift your entire uh, top table around every every um, AGM because that's not giving you any sort of long-term benefit either. So sort of getting people involved, looking at their uh, professions. I think, Connor, you mentioned earlier all the various different trades people you've got involved with. In it, and that's something that we see as well as people... Uh, who've got specialities getting involved. So I, I mentioned that, you know, I, I work on the, the tech side of things for, on a day-to-day -day basis at work, and that's generally where I found myself doing a lot of work with the club. And likewise, people who bring certain um, expertises to the table get involved, and we bring them to the table if and when they're needed, and hopefully get them to stay at the table then in terms of being a club officer. That's so important, Donald, having all these different skill sets from people that maybe have in their current day jobs that they can actually bring then into the clubs yeah in terms of the youth and bringing the youth on i mean to me it's so important to to get them involved at a very early age in in, in appreciating the asset that they have under like for us when we were kids in university and stuff like that the student summer job scheme was a great eye-opener in terms of appreciating what you've got to hand i mean there's a lot of work that goes into uh, mowing fields and painting dressing rooms and all that sort of stuff and you, you really come out of it at the end of a uh, a process like that saying well, you know we'll we'll take a bit more care of the dress rooms when we're in them from now on and i was blessed i suppose in terms of killing care they did a lot of facilities there and anybody that uh, became a barman or a barmaid or whatever bar person afterwards will have learned to play their trade in in behind the bar at the at the jamboree or or far and she nights or anything like that so it, it was it was great now we did see a move back about i would say about 15 20 years ago where they were they were actively encouraging young people to get involved in the executive and those people are still there uh and and, and they're encouraging others to get involved as well and that is really that's the lifeblood uh, the new the new energy that i spoke about the new ideas that the fresh and rather than kind of uh put putting away away at new ideas it's just to be open and be, be ready to embrace those that that positive change because you know there there there, there would have been maybe instances whereby for example you you would have people with young ideas coming in well, maybe we should open up to other aspects of the community um maybe, maybe it could be migrants maybe it could be the travelers maybe we could be looking at social enterprises being developed on site that wouldn't necessarily be revolved around ga and i know yes there's there's a, there's a thin line there that you can't cross but i, I recently came across an idea, I think it was in Dominic's and Common, where they built a, a hot desking space. And so that this was mentioned earlier on in the conversation to uh, mitigate the potential of migration out of the rural area. Now that the remote working is in, you know, the, the club weren't expecting some other entity to develop these facilities, they developed them themselves. And now you have four or five senior players that don't have to travel to Athlone or Galway for work. They're, they're, they're basically living and working beside the pitch that they'll be training at that evening. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's great, great, great ideas. Wow, that is brilliant here. And just when you were talking about earlier as well, you were saying the, the freshness that new people can bring in. You know, that's important too, I think, because sometimes, as you said, you can have people that have been in it for so long that they need someone to come from the outside to, to maybe see it a little bit differently and to bring those new ideas. So, so some of the projects that we've seen and that we've worked with and, and, and seen come to fruition, I mean, you certainly need new that new thought process coming in. It's, it's amazing. I mean, uh, even, even the guys on, on, on the call here, I mean, I for about 40 or well, 30 years was traveling up and down the, the, uh, the R147 past Carner Ross and, and all it was was two rooms and uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a little house, two dressing rooms and a pitch and all we ever thought about was, was it Ollie Murphy or something? I mean, that's the only thing we knew about, about Carner Ross. And one day I was driving down to Cavan and I seen this sign up outside the would-be great project uh, about their plans and 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 you, you ring you ring a member of the committee the phone number that's on on the card and you end up i mean if anybody if anybody's in that region take a look at that clubhouse in carras i mean it is absolutely beautiful concise i'll say petite but tidy and uh really really worth worth a visit now i'll say the same about mullerhorn the next time i get down and see it too <laughs> I'd say Donald as well that the, the the training grounds in in Carnaross, if I remember correctly, I've spent some time there in the late nineties, early noughties. I mean, a great open club as well. As you go by it, 
Um, I, I think a lot of the Mullerhorn boys that were based in Dublin and the Mullerhorn boys were ma- based in Mullerhorn ended up meeting halfway in Carnaross on right. Manny's an evening. Yeah. Yeah, and I suppose that's a great thing in the GA. You know, it's, 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 and I think, Ashley, you said it earlier on, or someone said, no matter where you go, if you, because I remember when I was in college and I went to America for summer and I played football over there and I went to Australia and I played football over there. And, you know, before you know it, you're, you're in a club and you're, 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 you're going for a point afterwards. And it's as if you, you knew lads all your life. Uh, it's a very welcoming, um, you know, um, place to be, you know, and on the, you know, in terms of say, the new, our new clubhouse, it's 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 right sized for our community, and um, we wouldn't have a massive population, so it's not we, we didn't go all out and, and and build a bar and build a build a big function room. We have a, a right sized um you know facility for for our community, and you know it's 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 used by the community, um so it's not just um it, well it is a GA facility, but it, it it's. We're a small community, so there's, there's um, the local Weight Watchers group. That, there's been loads of other uh, groups using it, you know, um, and it's it's an open door facility. Um, but um, it's it's um, it's making sure that the next generation feel as though that it's a nice facility and it's it's something that they that they enjoy being there. And I'm sure at one point, Connor, did it feel almost not impossible, but quite difficult to, to get this done, to, to have these facilities. And I suppose when you reach out and you talk and you get that guidance, then you realise, OK, look, you know, it, it's possible to do this. Um, yeah, there was there was um, the, 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 the money side of things was always going to be a challenge. I mean, like I think our initial um, we had two or three engineers, one one guy, a senior guy in Cisco, and another guy, another engineer, like and, and, and like was, it was three engineers um a draftsman, myself and finance, and then two or three other guys who were painters, block players, whatever. But we all came together, and I think the initial cost things for the whole facility was about six hundred thousand. And we we then we got it back to five fifty, and then we got it back to five, and then um, I think I think the total bill of quantities costs around five hundred in the end. But between donations in kind and uh, work done for your charge, uh, came to about two hundred grand in total and then we 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 did a um we, we got a grant um i think of about 110 and we did a fundraiser uh, and that all happened just pre-covid so we were very lucky that actually we didn't launch into this and then covid hit us because then it would have put a whole kibosh on all of the fundraising drives and everything else um and then we met donald and um Donald and his team, you know, they gave it a critical evaluation and they, they brought it through, a, a, you know, a credit check and, you know, they reviewed their finances and um, uh, we, we just got a feeling that community finance understood what we wanted to do in this community. And um, it, they, they, they've been a fantastic partner to us. And even during COVID now, we didn't miss any any payments. I think we went from monthly to quarterly for about six months. Um but we we have to miss any payments in our facilities, and we won't. You know, it's 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 because everyone can see what this has done for our our village, um, and um, it's opened the doors to everyone. So, um, yeah, no, it's it's it it has been fantastic. You know, but a lot of challenges along the way, and then when we cut out of COVID, then uh, we're now really beginning to use it now, um, and beginning to. Um, really enjoy it, and um, teams are coming in, and we 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 there was a, we played trim there the night, and um, the trim guys were were very impressed with you know that and that, then they were looking at our new pitch that we're doing as well, and um, again like you know we're only a small village, so we're not we don't have um like Rotota your your club actually Rotota fabulous club and like you guys are way way bigger than, than we we will never be that size, but you probably have facilities to cater for your population. Um, and I suppose the key thing there is that clubs have to right size their facilities and make sure that you don't build an albatross that you can't, you can't, uh, does not fit for purpose for your community. Um, so I think right sizing it was important um, and making sure that we, we, we measured it rightly at the time. Exactly, I think that's such an important point. And just on the back of our migrant chat, we just did have a question in from Lida, actually, from Community Finance Ireland. So she said, delighted, Connor, to hear that you have a Corconian helping to work with transformation of the club. 
what are some of the key coaching techniques that you've seen? So I don't know if this is off the back of having some core people in there that are helping with the with the coaching. <laughs> um, I suppose the coaching techniques have probably evolved more. Um, well, I suppose the, the safeguarding regulations and all of the the training that coaches now get around safeguarding um, has really, I think, formalized a lot of things. I mean, like um, when we were when we were kids, probably the coaches probably picked the, the the strong players and probably the weaker ones didn't get a shot or um and and I know that in our club and across the GAA um you have an equal playing time policy now for all children um and it's up to a certain age and then it gets competitive beyond that. And I think that the biggest eye opener that I've seen really is the, um, uh, the importance of all of that and the importance of giving everybody, all children, equal playing time irrespective of ability. Um, and then, and and that and that gives the that gives the the, the, the gives everyone a, a chance. Um, and then as they get older, then and games become competitive from eleven onwards. Um, you know, um, coaches have more will take more decisions about who who to play in that. But certainly, I think the the education path that coaches are going through now on how 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 to properly pick teams and give everybody an equal playing time i think it's been hugely important and i think that's something that uh, coaches are now getting probably proper guidance on that we didn't get before um and that's coming through sports ireland and um, the course that um it, it's it's and so it's not just the ga it's it's when i did the course there a couple of weeks ago there were there were um there were people on the course from local running clubs tennis clubs you know so it's sports ireland bringing down this um this kind of uh, philosophy and a methodology which i think is very is very open and very um you know very equal and i think that's very important because it gives every kid a, a chance to play for their club um, <clears throat> and wear the parish jersey and and they don't get frightened or, or pushed away because they're not the the biggest or the strongest on the team but they, they'll, they'll have those happy little memories when they when they get older that you know they, they played for their club and i think that's that's magic it is magic yeah and that's what, it, what it's all about i have such fond memories from playing underage and even some of my friends now we grew the whole way up on the on the same team together and you know the memories that we have are just incredible so yeah you wouldn't change it for the world and jim would you say that i suppose having played is a real motivator to stay involved with the club once you've hung up the boots or do you think that matters at all oh look at it i think no matter so i guess your your level of involvement now like i mentioned up and down to dublin i didn't do much of that myself now my, my footballing skills were were very limited so i spent more time on the bench i suppose than on the field when i was a young lad that said though um it didn't dampen the enthusiasm for the game so regardless of you know where your skill sets lie, um, I, I think staying involved with the club is really a must. So if you're, if you're there in the community, uh, you're more than likely going to be a parent of some of the kids that are coming through. You're staying involved either as a mentor of a team or getting involved in the running of the day-to-day of the club. Basically, whatever your skill set brings to the table, there's always a place for you. And I think that that's probably going to be the case across all of the, all of the clubs in, in the country. You know, I think, Connor, you mentioned some of the training techniques as well. Like, I mean, if you think about it, an average Gaelic football match from the early 90s and compared with what you'll see, uh, the ferry you'll see today, completely different game. Um, so, you know, the game has evolved <coughs> over time in terms of coaching and even looking at the fundamental coaching courses that I think all of our coaches are required to have at this point and the support you're getting from your county board coaching teams. They really do push forward. Um, uh, well, not necessarily agenda, but a technique, um, ways of playing the game and keep staying up to speed with where the game is moving and, and the levels of fitness that are out there now, because I think of all of these facilities that we've developed is incomparable to what it was, uh, say, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, so look, at, I, I think absolutely there's a pathway from going to being a, uh, from being a player to being um, an administrator or a mentor or whatever position it is, but the club is there for all ages. Um, and I look, people may prefer to get involved in mentoring and even refereeing, for example, as they get a little bit older. Um, some want to do it a little bit younger. Um, there's absolutely nobody standing in the way for, for any of those paths. Yeah, there's a way in for everyone. Absolutely. And Donald, how would you have found, I suppose, transitioning from player to, to being involved in club? Only last year you hung up the boots, not that long ago. 
tell you, I'm still feeling, I'm still feeling the effects of it. Um, no, for me, the major, major thing here is, is group dynamic. So you've spent 20 to 30 years playing with a group of lads or girls, you know, uh, you know, week in, week out, you know, back in the days where there was no break during the summer. So you weren't supposed to go on holidays and, you know, God forgive you if you if developed a relationship with a partner and expected, you know, you know, to, that, that you would be going out on a Saturday night or anything like that, that, that wasn't going to happen. You see, when you hang up the boots and all of a sudden that group dynamic stops, it's actually quite traumatizing for most people because all of a sudden you, well, you're no longer the center of attention for a group of people or even the parish if the case may be. They're no longer going out to see you playing on a, on a Friday evening or a Sunday morning, whatever it might be. So what do you do? Do you wallow away in, in, in looking at four walls and thinking, regretting about all the, you know, the shots that you missed and the pass that you should have given, which is my major regret is the pass I should have given. But, um, you know, or do you, or, do you, or do you go back to that same community and say, well, look at lads, I might be able to play ball anymore, but I can certainly ha- help out on the fundraising committee or, you know, with, with, with child safeguarding or whatever, or whatever it might be. That's, that's, that's why you'll have so many people coming, coming back to the fold. And even, even those immigrants, those people that had to leave the country, the club should never forget about the importance of those guys. I mean, that, that, that diaspora, can, can often be your most lucrative source of support into the future. I mean, I've seen a stand being built uh, from Chicago in Mayo, you know, from immigrants. Uh, so this is, and, and we kind of tend to forget, but there's nobody more prouder of your local club, nobody more proud of your local club than those immigrants. You know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they would wear the club colours in Dubai, in Australia, in America, New Zealand, wherever it might be. And, and they're always buying the local Chronicle or the anglo Celt or whatever, like looking it up online. They always want to know what the scores are at the end of the weekend. You know, they're more interested than the guys that are probably living two or three kilometres from the pitch. So uh, that's what I would say. That's my advice to clubs is continue to, to reach out and throw that cast that net as wide as possible. Um, they're talking about coaching techniques and I'm laughing because, you know, uh, Jim there made reference to 20, 30 years ago. I think the major thing, and Connor touching on it, the referees, their coaching techniques have changed significantly. If you look it up on YouTube, there's a county final between Mullahorn and Kingscourt uh, that was recorded in Breffney Park. It's, it's up there and, you, and, and look at it. And you know what I mean about the difference in the referee and technique. Are you saying that it's, it's completely worse? It's a complete. I'm just saying the referee's approach to the game is a lot different now than it was. 30. I think our our current club chairman might have been on the receiving end of um, well, I don't know it'll be assault <laughs> today's violence. Oh wow, my God! Well, yeah, I think that, yeah, the referees is probably one area we still need to work on a small bit. But even when you mentioned um. Just when you retire and you make that transition and going back into the club, don't I actually spoke with Brendy McVeigh from County Down. He would have been the goalkeeper for years, saving the 2010 All Ireland final. I don't think he'd mind me saying we, we spoke about it on a podcast. And he said he, you know, he used to go in, throw the bag in the corner and then be out the next night. And he said he just like would look at the bag in the corner once he retired. And he said, I just didn't know what to do with myself. I didn't know where to be going it in the evenings, you know. He had more time at home, yes. And of course that was great, but he said, you know, I missed being in that group and he'd meet people out around the local town and they'd like, oh, Brandy, the goalkeeper. And he was like, but I'm not the goalkeeper anymore. So it was these sort of things that he couldn't sort of fathom, you know, for, for quite a while. But then he got back as a goalkeeper coach with his club. Now he's heavily involved with the team. Um, he's actually, with, he was with the down under twenties and stuff. So, you know, that, that fulfilled that again for him, but you know, it's, it's it is just shows that there is that aspect of, you know, once you're finished, it, it doesn't have to be it. You know, there's, those more areas that you can be involved in within a club. But we do have um, a few questions that I might get to because we're running out of time and a few people have wrote in, if that's okay. So the first one, Connor, I might give to you. Um, I know you had spoke about COVID. So the first one was, after the two years COVID stole from us, had the guys noticed any drop-off in develop- involvement in their clubs from the local community, particularly from non-players? Uh, I would say probably quite the opposite, actually. I think that when, when COVID, when we got out of COVID, I think the, the energy and the electricity to get back out to the pitch um, from uh, young and old has been amazing. Um, and I think that the challenge nearly would be to maintain that bounce uh, because um, there was this pent up um, frustration for, for, for not being able to train and you know even when we were back training and playing football there was restrictions around challenge matches and mm-hmm. we had COVID officers and you'd be going to a match and you'd be doing all the COVID checks or the, the COVID checklist whatever like uh, so I think that 
um, uh, no, that it's it's it hasn't stopped it at all. Um, it's certainly not at volunteer level and a coach level, but certainly I know that from talking to some of the lads on the on the adults team, um, that some of the players, um, didn't come back, and we 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 experienced a drop in probably some of the adult players initially, um, but certainly not. Uh, amongst the ch- the kids and like say below the age of 21 um that certainly and it wasn't impacted at all uh, in fact it, it's come back with a bounce and the challenge i feel is going to be maintaining that bounce because um uh it, it is the initial kind of release and we, we need to make sure that we, we kind of harness that energy um so um so it's, it's come back with a bounce really by and large yeah great to hear and this next one then Jim I will throw it your way we did sort of cover it and um, it was about key coaching techniques that you've seen change so where do you guys access training and coaching development programs yeah I suppose I, I, I've probably seen that one popping up which is why I might have uh, been drawn towards it a little bit when I mentioned a bit earlier but um, yeah the, the coaching fundamentals course I think is a requirement for all of the coaches you know on top of safeguarding and all those other uh, requirements just to make sure that you know, we have appropriate levels of capability on the line, both uh, from a coaching and safeguarding perspective. And then you get massive amount of support from the likes of um, the county board, right? So they've got coaching officers going into the school, but they're also coming out and and they're holding sessions with the coaches. They're passing on those techniques. And, you know, even some of the online, um, the online material that's available on, I think it's learning.ga. I mean, you can set up an entire session from that, print it out, you know, share it out with the rest of the coaches, uh, you know, communicate via whatever uh, messaging system you're using before the session. Make sure everything is lined up. Look, at not everybody's doing it that way, um, but the capability is there to do it, and and certainly the uh, the tools are there to support us to do it. But you know, I'd say the key thing is is the, really the support from the likes of the county board where they're getting those coaches out because they're they're sort of setting all of those tools out in front of people. They're making sure they know how to use them. And, um, you know, we're carrying out those techniques forward. We're comparing ourselves against their peers and other clubs. And, you know, where they're moving forward, um, the challenge is for us to keep up with them and get ahead of them. Brilliant. That is great to know. And then for Dona, we have one. Um, if we're not sure what type of loan we need, how do we speak to community finance about the first steps? Well, we're, we're, we're always looking for ways to say yes to as many organisations as possible, Ashley. So obviously the first place to go would be communityfinanceireland.com our website and we have numerous methods of contacting us so we're fairly um, active on Twitter, LinkedIn and Facebook as well and Spotify we have a podcast series so if you search uh, Community Finance Ireland on Spotify and YouTube, the YouTube channel with a lot of our videos and some of the clubs that we've we've uh, financed are, are uh, profiled in, in those as well but really the first protocol is communityfinanceireland.com you can take a look at some of the case studies and make uh, make a connection with us through, through that, through that uh, means. And a question that actually uh, two or three people actually asked me after our last session was about how social finance can work with receiving sports grants. Yeah, I suppose. Uh, and I was just uh, at an event earlier on today and, and I mentioned this, you know, uh, sports grants, like a lot of other state grants, um, they come with a caveat. And sometimes it's in the small print and sometimes it's not there at all. And sometimes it catches uh, executive committees by surprise. They're retrospective in nature. So therefore, what that means is you, you may get awarded a grant of, for argument's sake, 100,000 euro to build a clubhouse or contribute towards a clubhouse. But the reality is you need to spend that 100 grand first. So you need to pay a contractor and get a receipt from the contractor to say that it was paid before you go about claiming the grant. So we find ourselves about 12 to 15 percent of our business is involved in bridging finance. So we would we would actually provide that upfront cash to the club to carry out the works, pay the contractor, and then we would wait on the grant to be drawn down and the grant would then ultimately clear off the loan. And during that period of time, which could be six, eight, you know, 24 months, whatever it might be, the club would pay an interest only repayment back to us. So it wouldn't be too detrimental in terms of negative implications and cash flow. So it's fairly affordable in that regard. I mean, that lending is done on an unsecured basis. There's never any arrangement fees. You know, the maximum that you would pay on that is something like 6.25%. Uh, and, and versus what the potential other alternatives, there, there are very few uh, in, in, in terms of those terms and conditions. But as opposed to just the bridging, in a lot of cases, take the, the, the current climate, for example, where construction costs are, are continuing to rise at exorbitant rates. You know, when, when sports capital is announced first, 
you have a project plan, you price it as best you can, and you wait. You know, six, eight, ten months later on, sports capital grants are awarded. You get maybe a fraction, uh, a sizable fraction of what you originally had intended that you were going to assume you're going to get. And then you go back to the contractors and, and the prices have gone up. And so now you've got that shortfall in your funding package whereby there's, there's, a, there's a requirement for you to go back to the pot and maybe do a bit more fundraising. But the chances are that, you know, you've already touched them, the touch the population for a sizable amount of money already. So you may not get all that. So this is where we come in and provide that other matching term finance. Anything up to a, a half a million in cases has been provided on an unsecured basis to clubs. So we've, we, we, we do that. Uh, on terms and conditions that are as affordable as possible to volunteer-led entities. These people, uh, Connor and Jim, you know, are committed um, to the organisations. Is there a falling out tonight at a board meeting? They walk away from the club in the morning. You know, there are risks that the conventional banking system aren't prepared to take. But we appreciate that there's community buy-in. That's the one thing that we look for. We look at the community buy-in and the resilience of these, of these parishes, these parochial communities that they will have had achievements and milestones in the past, but they've also had problems. And we love to see the problems because we see the way that they've overcome them and they've gotten themselves out of those problematic issues. That gives great confidence to an investor, a social investor like us, where our first, where our first eye is on social impact. How is this going to benefit the local community at all levels? And then can we, is, is there a payment capacity there as well? I think, um, uh, oh, go ahead, Connor. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, so, sorry, Ashley. Uh, no, I think the key thing there um, would work for us anyway was that um, you should never rely on any one form of finance. So basically, we would have gotten support from community finance, which was invaluable. We would have got a sports capital grant, and we also done fundraising. So if you, if you if you're just waiting around for the for, for, for Donald to come in with community finance and, and borrow everything off Donald or you're waiting for the sports capital grant or if you're just waiting for the, for the big fundraiser um, you know you, you, you can't it's you can't be just a one-trick pony you have to have a multi-tronged strategy to, to fundraising and to generate funding for the club and actually what we did was we found that um, there was a couple of guys in the club um, who were really good at fundraising and like they, they, they'd go out and they, they, they could fundraise anywhere. They could go to, there was guys that were involved in sales or involved in companies, whatever. And they were just the best fundraisers in the country. And then there's other guys then who, who, who would say like myself, whatever, who'd be able to look, look at finance options and, you know, work with the likes of community finance, work out a good level of finance that we should get without putting ourselves under too much pressure. What can we afford? What can we stress test in terms of cash flow and so forth? And then, there was one or two other guys then who were very familiar with uh, getting government grants and they were able to work their way around the government grant system and, um, you know, to make sure that we were getting as much as we could get. And um, so basically, you know, that's that was key for us. You kind of have to have that multi trong strategy of, of not never relying, being over reliant on one source of finance. Um, and, and, and like that, that worked very well for us. And it also spread the risk as well that, you know, you're not overly geared, you're not uh, overly reliant on fundraising or you're not overly reliant on grants. So, um, but the timing of some of the grants, as Donald said, was key as well. So, um, you know, you, you need to have, I, 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 I think we, we, got, we got the grants, but, you know, to, 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 for, to spend that money first, we, we part, part funded it from community finance and from our own fundraising. And we ran a big, a couple of big fundraising drives um, around the critical times of the development. Um, and there were there were big, de decent money spinners for us, you know, but definitely it was a multi-tronged strategy which worked for us. And I would encourage any club to, to, to don't be just looking at one source of finance. Have, have, have your eyes wide open and be thinking of everything, you know? I think that's a really important point to make. And one of the last questions that I'm going to come to you, we just have enough time for one more. It was typically, you don't know, what is the most popular form of social finance for clubs? Oh, uh, can you just develop on that question, Ashley, in terms of the, the, the type of social finance? Yeah, so is there different types of finance that they can come and speak to you about? Is there different options for, I suppose, different size clubs and different ways of, um, I suppose, getting it back to you, that sort of thing? Yeah, it's, it's very much a bespoke approach, Ashley. So we're lending between 10,000 and half a million euro. Mostly we have gone over the half a million mark on occasions by exception. Um, the repayment terms can be anything from three months of a short term bridging finance option, like what we spoke about there with the sports capital grants, to 15 years repayments. Uh, so it, yeah, we'd never penalize clubs for doing fundraisers and paying back 
lump sums or the entirety of the loan ahead of schedule. This is where the cavern personality comes in. We get the money back in one piece as quickly as possible. I'm very, very happy. We don't charge any penalties for that. And the other thing that we've built in as well is that the repayment amount, uh, especially in, a, in an environment now where you see increases in the, in the European Central Bank interest rates coming down the line, the repayments amount will stay the same. So it's like, it looks like a fixed rate product where you would generally be penalized if you pay it back. But what we will do instead is we'll, we'll just ask the same amount of money back in repayments every month. So the cash flow of the club is, 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 is intact, kept intact. And we'll extend the term of the loan out slightly. A bit like the credit unions would do with you or I with a, with a car loan if, if interest rates went through the roof. So there's, there's, if everything that we do is customer focused is like, how do we best serve these communities, these volunteer-led organizations that are trying, how do we enable them to enable, you know, enable themselves? That's essentially what, what, what we're trying to do. We're, we're just trying to make sure that, that that social impact that is often often dreamt in local areas is actually felt by the local community. So if, if there are organizations that come back to us and say, look at Donald, we have, we have a country music festival once a year. We have nothing else that happens during the year. So can you wait and take one repayment off us on an annual basis? Well, yeah, well, then if that's the only way this project is going to work and we can get you across the line, that's what we'll do. Amazing. I think that's probably the most important thing that people understand that, that you get it, that, you know, you're part of a club, you're out there, you, you know what it's like, you know, that's so important because sometimes you, you might wonder, oh God, you know, the, you have a fear of having a loan. But when you just explain it like that, it's, it's amazing to know it, it's so feasible and so easily done. Well, look, unfortunately, that is all we have time for this evening. And I hope you've enjoyed it and found it informative. And don't forget that this is the only second in a series of five free panel discussions. And the next event is going to play take place next Tuesday. Or sorry, the Tuesday, the following Tuesday, we have the, the bank holiday in there. So it's going to be Tuesday, the 7th of June at 7 p.m. And we'll focus on the team of supporting GA clubs on and off the pitch. And you can go to communityfinanceireland.com to register. A massive thank you to Jim Riley from Mullahorn, GFC in Cavan, Connor Woods from Colonel Ross, GFC in County Mead, and Donald Trainer, the group CEO of Community Finance Ireland. And thank you as well to the whole Community Finance Ireland team. And most importantly, to the attendees for joining us this evening. We'll be back again on Tuesday, 7th of June. Good night.